Good evening. So I'm very glad to be here tonight for this TEDx event. So I'm very fortunate to work with a wonderful group of people. This is my lab and I want to acknowledge the students and postdocs working with me. So uh, what an inmate's uh, operation is to understand the neural mechanism underlying decision making and reward processing. One fundamental question is to understand how from the 100 billions of neurons that constitute our brain, how can emerge complex cognitive functions such as motivated choice? So the type of questions that we are addressing is to uh, make some links between different levels of organization in the brain to understand the relationships between the genetic or hormonal levels to the cellular, neuroimaging and the behavioral level. To do this, we use a technique known as functional magnetic resonance imaging. This technique allows us to use um, um, fMRI not only to view the specific anatomy of individual subjects, but also to investigate brain activity when people perform cognitive tasks inside the scanner. So what people typically do is that they view images presented on the screen and they have to respond to a specific button according to the instruction given to them by the experimenter. And uh, they can do a number of paradigms like this. And um, what we are trying to address is to understand what drives our behavior. So for no scientists, there are a number of um, uh, so-called rewards, such as food, drinks, sex, money, or social status, that are uh, the driver of, of, of our um, motivation. And there have been a different functions that have been attributed to these rewards, uh, such as learning, as they make subject come back for more, as well as approach and consumatory behavior um, to acquire your uh, desired object. Finally, uh, the, the rewards also induce uh, positive emotions at the time of the consumption. So it's now possible to distinguish between these different functions and to investigate uh, the, their corresponding uh, brain uh, mechanism. Why is it important to understand the neural substrate of reward processing and decision making in humans? Well, uh, not only to understand the basic uh, mechanism in healthy subject, but also to understand uh, no pathologies which are known to be dysfunctional, um, and particularly concerning the reward uh, system. So there are, for example, a number of pathologies such as drug addiction, but also impulse control disorders, which are characterized by impulsivity, uh, which is a failure to resist to uh, temptation, such as pathological gambling or hypersexuality. There are other diseases such as schizophrenia or Parkinson's disease, which are also engaging this uh, reward system that I'm going to tell you about. So what is this reward system that I'm mentioning? So this is just a view of the brain uh, where in the red circle you can see uh, neurons that are called dopaminergic neurons. And these neurons are very important to modulate a large number of cognitive, motivational and emotional functions. These neurons project to uh, some regions, such as the frontal lobe, the most anterior part of the, of, the of, the, of the brain, as well as subcortical regions, such as the striatum. And by doing so, they release a molecule known as dopamine, which come to modulate the different function uh, of free that I was just telling you about. In the past few decades, um, monkey electrophysiologists have been able to record directly from these dopaminergic neurons, while uh, animals make a uh, different type of task and uh, what we have learned in particular is how these dopaminergic neurons respond at specific time of behavior. For example, when learning to associate a visual cue such as this blue uh, fractal with the reward, what happens is that these dopaminergic neurons respond at the time of the reward before learning and then after or during learning, there is a progressive shift from the time of the reward delivery to the time of the cue that is um, not functioning here, but uh, there is a gradual shift from the response uh, of the dopaminergic neurons at the reward to the uh, cue predicting the reward delivery. If unexpectedly there is an omission of the reward at the time of the reward delivery, these neurons show a depression, which is indicated here by, by this uh, rectangle. 
So um, everything happens as if there was a prediction error signal in the brain, which encodes a discrepancy between what is expected and what is actually delivered. So this uh, signal is very important to learn association between uh, cues and reward delivery. And this is a general mechanism that we have been studying in humans using very similar approach. So here we do not use juice or rewards uh, as in animals uh, experiment, but we use, for example, slot machine experiment where different type of fractal stimuli, such as this one, were predicting uh, with certain chance uh, monetary gains. And using this type of paradigm, it is possible now to distinguish the different functions of the reward that I was telling you about, such as learning, approach, and consumatory behavior. For example, we have been able to decompose the brain signals that are engaged at different stages of reward processing. In particular, when we present the slot machine, at the time of the queue, there is a subjective value of the potential reward which is represented in the brain that corresponds to the utility function for economists. And during anticipation of the reward, other brain regions show up, um, particularly when the reward in is particularly uncertain during this period where the slot machines um, have the spinners that roll around. Finally, at the time of the outcome, when the reward is delivered, and particularly when the reward is very unpredicted, so when there is a very low chance of winning, there is this uh, prediction error signal that I was just mentioning that is engaging not only dopaminergic neurons, but also uh, regions that uh, receive afferents from these uh, dopaminergic neurons. So, so far I told you about uh, reward, uh, but I did not distinguish between uh, two important types of reward, which are primary rewards and secondary rewards. Primary rewards are of an innate value and are essential for survival and, and homeostasis, and they have a particular evolutionary um, importance because they are essential for survival. In contrast, secondary rewards are learned through association uh, with primary rewards. So, um, up to uh, the f past few years, um, most of animal research was done with juice or um, food reward, while um, human studies were performed with monetary reward because it's uh, easily quantifiable and the chance of winning can be easily manip manipulated experimentally. So what we have done in the past few years is to investigate the neural representation of different types of reward in humans. And what we do, for example, in this experiment, is to scan heterosexual males while they view monetary reward or erotic stimuli. And the hypothesis we had was to investigate whether there are common brain regions, regardless of reward type, as well as specific regions engaged specifically for money or for erotic stimuli. And this is what we observe. In fact, there are uh, um, both systems. So there is a common brain network known as a um, a common neural currency, and um, this is shown here in the red circle. These are the brain regions that refeed, receive from dopaminergic neurons and that are more engaged at the time of the reception of the reward, regardless of the reward type. There is also increased activity in these brain regions uh, with the hedonic value of the reward. In addition to this common brain network, there is also specific coding of each type of reward that is the entire part of the brain, which is shown here, uh, which is called the orbitofrontal cortex, is more engaged with monetary reward, while the more posterior part of the orbitofrontal cortex, which is shown is in, is in red, is engaged more specifically with erotic stimuli. So this is interesting because we know that the orbitofrontal cortex has developed recently during evolution. And since monetary reward has also occurred relatively recently during human history, it's an interesting link between uh, dissociation uh, observing the brain and um, the properties of different types of rewards. So again, to come back to the question I was addressing, why is it important to study the neural substrate of reward processing and decision making? Well, we can use this type of paradigms used in healthy subjects to apply them in a number of disorders. And this is the approach we have done in, in the past few years, in, patho in pathological gambling in particular. 
So in a number of these orders, there are a specific reward domain which is supposed to be more impaired than another reward domain. In pathological gambling, it's a monetary re reward domain which is supposed to be more impaired. And this is why we investigated these two types of uh, reward, monetary reward and erotic uh, stimuli in pathological gambling. What we found is that um, in addition to this entire part of the orbitofrontal cortex, which is recruited uh, with monetary reward, pathological gamblers also engage uh, the posterior part of the orbitofrontal cortex for money, which is normally recruited only um, for erotic stimuli in healthy subject, as if pathological gamblers experience monetary gains as a primary reward. So, what do we do with this knowledge um, concerning reward processing? regarding the main question that we wanted to address regarding the neural mechanisms underlying decision-making. Well, the relationship is very simple for neuroscientists because we now know that value-based decision is made uh, in two main stages. In first stage, there is a valuation which is done, which attributes a value to each option under consideration. And in the second stage, there is a selection mechanism where uh, the option that has the highest value is actually selected. So to test this type of decision um, inside the scanner, we use cost-benefit decision, where people need to weight potential cost and benefit. And I want to illustrate this uh, by a type of uh, a delayed gratification paradigm that we have been using. So imagine I give you a choice inside the scanner, and I ask you, would you prefer to receive 20 euro now, or uh, 40 euro in 30 days? Obviously, there are uh, anti-individual anti differences. Some people may be more patient, and others may be more impulsive. And this is reflected in the different curves that, you show that are shown here, that shows the subjective value of the delayed option, which is discounted very steeply in more impulsive subjects. So we can use now uh, this type of paradigm to test uh, what are the brain regions that are engaged during this valuation process at the time of the decision. And we have shown that both for primary reward and for money, there is a, a common brain network, which is a valuation system, the very same system that is uh, shown to be engaged at the time of the outcome, re regardless of the type of, of reward. So it's interesting because the same reward system that is engaged at the time of the experience value is also engaged at the time of the, uh, the valuation. <coughs> now, sorry, um, how can we use this uh, to make link between different levels of organization? Well, this delayed gratification type of paradigm uh, that I just told you about is often used to test impulsivity. And we know that there are strong links between impulsive behavior and a uh, number of addictions, such as behavioral addiction, pa pathological gambling, but also drug addiction. So, as I just mentioned, we are not all equal towards uh, uh, impulsivity. There may be some genetic predisposition or some hormonal influence. And uh, in the past few years, we have done a number of fMRI experiments to try to make links between these different levels of, of organization I was mentioning at the beginning. And to do this, we uh, uh, genotype subjects before they enter the scanner, and we um, make subgroups of subjects according to specific uh, variation in genes that are involved in dopamine transmission. And what we are able to show is that genetically influenced variation in dopamine transmission modulate the response of this reward system, particularly during anticipation and at the time of the reception of the reward, for example, when playing slot machines. This response may contribute to inter-individual difference, explaining uh, inter-individual inter di difference in terms of reward-seeking behavior, impulsive behavior, and in predisposition to a neuropsychiatric disease. We have used a very similar approach not only in the um, link between a gene and brain system level, but also to link the hormonal level to the brain system level. So we know, for example, that uh, in women, estradiol and progesterone not only play a role for uh, reproductive behavior, but are also in important to mod modulate cognitive and affective state, as well as vulnerability to drug of abuse. So what we have done is, for example, to scan healthy young women across the menstrual cycle or older women with hormone replacement therapy as compared to placebo. 
And what we have been able to show is that there is indeed a neurofunctional modulation of this reward system uh, by gonadal steroid hormone in humans. This establishes a neurobiological foundation for understanding the impact of hormones on neuropsychiatric disease, which have a differential expression across men and women. So to conclude, I want to come back to the original slide um, that uh, tried to make uh, links between different levels of organization. And uh, I want to conclude to mention that uh, complex diseases such as uh, schizophrenia are not due to a single gene, obviously. So the approach taken by neuroscientists today is to try to identify what is uh, called behavioral phenotypes, such as impulsivity that I was uh, taking as an example today, and to make links between this type of uh, behavior with the brain system level and to uh, specific variation in genes involved in particular in dopamine transmission. Thank you for your attention.